Okay, good afternoon. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all our attendees to the second session of the day, uh, Thoracic Anesthesia. I'm pleased to present uh, Dr. Al Anoud uh, Al Hatimi. She would be co chairing the session. And it is my pleasure to present our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mohammed Dagostani, our senior consultant, Thoracic Anesthesiology. Uh, Dr. Dagostani has obtained his uh, training at the University of Ottawa, has uh, almost 20 years of clinical and administrative experience. Uh, Dr. Dagostani had been the uh, chairman for the Department of Anesthesiology at the National Guard uh, in Jeddah, and currently he's the chairman at the International uh, Medical Center in Jeddah. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, for your first presentation, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim, uh, for the uh, presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about a uh, topic which basically um, have uh, caught a bit of an attention in terms of the COVID. So we are in the COVID era. So my talk is about thoracic anesthesia in the COVID era. So I'm going to start by disclosing that I have no affiliation of um, any financial or any other organization related to this activity. And I'm going to proceed with my presentation um, about what we know in the field of thoracic anesthesia. Now, um, if we remember very well this famous photography of the World Health Organization declaring COVID-19 outbreak as a pandemic in March, 2020. And that have changed our life and globally it affected a lot of places. The world that we used to know is no longer the world that we know. And in these photographs, you could clearly recall the events and the things that happened to us globally, uh, starting from the Holy Mosque in Mac uh, towards the curfew in cities and, and the effect that happened and so on. So everything have changed, which means even our clinical practice that we know have changed dramatically. In fact, the fact that we're giving this conference as a virtual just proves that this is what happened. If you remember in the 13th annual meeting, this is what we were all together happily smiling. Right now we are behind screens. So let me just start by looking at few points in my presentation here. So if we talk about thoracic anesthesia, now what we used to know in terms of the physiology of the lungs in the upright lateral position, in terms of the pressures gradient, in terms of oxygenation, dependent, non-dependent, and all of these factors, it's true that some of these physiologic changes remains the same and they remain as a basic principles to thoracic anesthesia. However, the situation is completely new for us. And I, I must say that because none of us have been exposed to this you know, uh, pandemic before. We don't have the enough experience in terms of the true effects of this infection on the lungs pathophysiology. Now we know some information but we don't know exact fact because things are still evolving in that place. So we were not trained for it. Now, airway management and control is challenging and I'm gonna uh, describe later on why it is challenging. We still apply principles of thoracic anesthesia as general, but the principles have changed to some extent. Now, physiology of ventilation oxygenation is a bit different. There's tools and equipments which have evolved in that era. Knowledge is still lagging behind. We are still looking at different differences. Uh, we're looking at different experiences globally and research is still under development. So what exactly do we know? Well, let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna move to the next. Uh, so I had a look at several references there. Uh, and most of them, if you notice, 2020, surprisingly, this is the first time in any conference that the presenter present references from the same year. Well, this year is different. 
So if I look at pathogenesis of the COVID and just quickly look at it, what I'm more concerned as a thoracic anesthetist is the effects on the lungs. So we know there is alveolar damage. We know there is hypoxia. We know there is a disseminated you know, uh, effects on the circulation, cytokine storm that affects the basement level. It will cause uh, hypoxia and respiratory failure. Now, this is something we have to bear in mind because this is what we're going to deal with in thoracic. A recent you know, publication in the anesthesiology, and it talks about you know, trusted evidence and relation to practice, and it describes the pathophysiology of the COVID on the basement membrane at the alveolar level. And we can see there is a bit of a damage that happens. There is a release of organism and release of cytokines and inflammatory storm that happens and flood the lungs with damage. And that's why hypoxia starts to occur. Mind you, there is micro thrombotic changes that happens in these capillaries in, in the lung. Now, if we look at studies that have looked at ventilation and in relation to that part, starting from 95 all the way down. Now, the bottom part, the red and the orange, these did not show any uh, effects in terms of, of efficacy on ventilation because this is our main concern and this is what we should understand as thoracic anesthesiologists when it comes down because we're going to deal with those patients and the primary and the most important focus there is oxygenation. Now, we know that low tidal volume work very well. We know that conservative fluids does work. We know that prone position does work. And those who uh, started their practice uh, early on in the 90s uh, uh, do remember very well there was an era where prone positioning was very high among patients with ARDS in uh, ICUs. Now, I'm going to move uh, a bit towards uh, another fact with relation to COVID. Now, we know that the chemoreceptor, uh, you know, guide in the carotid body, which actually looks at the effects of oxygenation and the CO2. The problem here is the shunt part is not related to interstitial lung disease per se. So what happens in those patients, the fact that the oxygen drops, secondary to that, there's going to be a bit of hypoxia, which start to adapt gradually and slowly. So the low hypoxic ventilatory response is noticeable in these patients. And that's why sometimes you do not see a major respiratory compromise. However, their oxygen saturation have dropped dramatically. And this is part of the pathophysiology of the disease that we need to pay a focus on it. And we need to understand it, the hemostatic feed part, which relates to respiratory compromise and the effects on the respiratory function is actually changed in COVID patients. Now, what do we know so far? So we know there is aerosol generating, you know, uh, procedures. So we have to avoid it. We have to make sure that we do not get exposed to it. We have to protect ourselves and we have to protect our staff inside the operating room. The anesthesia team should wear a full personal protective equipment in COVID patients. And we know that, and believe me, it is not something simple. It is very challenging to be in those PPE equipments. We should start to consider using disposable tools. And in fact, the technology have evolved in that line dramatically to the point that there is disposable fiber optic scopes, video laryngoscopes, and other you know, tools related to intubation. Now, the Saudi Anesthesia uh, 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 Society have published uh, one of the early on uh, societies talking about airway management in, in, and that was in March at the moment of declaration of the pandemic. And as you can see the full PPE gear there, and this is just my picture with my assistants just before we put our gloves on and move into the operating room, it is actually very challenging and it does limit your vision to a greater extent. Mind you, the difficulty in breathing in N95 inside those suits as well. Okay, so adaptation to our routine work in thoracic. We have to put, of course, filters on the equipment, starting from the inspiratory towards the expiratory part. We have to make sure that things are protected to prevent any aerosol related in the environment of the operating room. 
especially when we are dealing with rigid laryngoscope. That's an issue there. And we have to be very careful because the amount of aerosol generation is very high. So we have to go on a very small, limited tidal volumes ventilation to prevent aerosol from spreading all over in the environment and to protect our staff. Uh, in the picture there, in, which is labeled B, you could see a double lumen tube and we could see the limb that have deflated the lung. We put a filter on it. So that will prevent risking it, pollution of the environment inside the OR. And this is something we have changed. We have learned because of the basic principles of aerosol generating you know, uh, respiratory related uh, oxygenation. Again, this is a clearer picture there where you could see you have put a filter there with the yellow arrow and another filter connected to it. So you want to prevent as much as possible any spread of infection in the environment of the operating room. Now, the challenging part is the oxygenation part. And believe me, I do not have a clear recipe for you except by you have to understand the basic pathophysiology of ventilation, the one I've mentioned, that small tidal volumes, you wanna limit the PEEP and you want to make sure that the ventilation is maintained at a smaller tidal volume to prevent injury to the lungs. Another picture there, just to clear that you put the anti-filter, uh, the antiviral filter at the open end of the double lumen tube, which is very different from what we used to do in the normal days, because that would have remained open in the atmosphere normally when we deal with uh, thoracic patients. Again, this picture will show exactly what we need to do by different modalities related to lung isolation. So if we're using the arm that, or if we're using the Fuji uni blocker, the same thing, you connect your airway connector, the 15 millimeter adapter to it, and immediately you should put a filter on it. So you prevent any risk to the atmosphere. At the right side, you see the three pictures there. This clearly describing what I'm talking about. Now, disposable fiber optic is available. And in fact, uh, it is one of the recommended tools to use in COVID patients, because with these tools, you guarantee there is no risk of cross-contamination and transmission of infection among healthcare workers. Uh, this is adopted from the European Journal of the Cardiothoracic. It's a consensus that have talked uh, several experts in the field of thoracic anesthesia, and they have put an algorithm there. That algorithm describes how do you deal with thoracic patients when it comes down to surgery. The most important, and as you can see in the general consideration, you should always consider the urgency of the surgery. And if it is not urgent, it's better to postpone until you pass that acute stage of acute infection. If you have to proceed despite the general consideration, then you're gonna go through the algorithm of whether lung isolation is needed or not. Of course, if you can limit the lung isolation technique, that would be better because that will save to prevent any risk of contamination to the healthcare workers within the operating room. If it is a must, then bronchial blocker with a single tube could be your possibility there. If the patient is not already intubated, you're gonna have to go through the pre-oxygenation part, but that you have to limit the pre-oxygenation. You have to make the mask is fitting nicely to the patient. You minimize the time. You want to do it with an assistant uh, next to you. So you use low volume, especially after induction and paralyzing agents given to the patient. On the right side, you can see through the algorithm if you proceed for tracheal intubation in patients who are unanticipated difficult airway, you wanna intubate as soon as possible, whether it's double lumen tube or easy blocker or endotracheal tube with a blocker that is your target, and then you confirm the position by the fiber optic. In the right side, if it is anticipated, always consider awake fiber optic, but here, topicalization and aerolization, you have to be careful because you don't want to make any risk about exposing to the patient aerosols. 
Now, moving along that, if you're succeeding, you're gonna put an endotracheal tube and you proceed with lung isolation. If you failed, then you're gonna have one or two attempts by an expert. And hopefully by that time you should succeed and you proceed towards the lung isolation technique. Now, after your surgery is done, the question here, whether the patient is still needs that tube for mechanical ventilation or not, that is judged by the amount of oxygenation that this patient is gonna be faced with. If he's ready to be extubated, you're gonna have to make sure that you prepare everything and you are ready to re-intubate again. If it is not ready for extubation because of the oxygenation part, you wanna continue with mechanical ventilation in the algorithm there and you continue. If it is a double lumen tube, you wanna exchange that with a tube changer and again, you limit ventilation, you limit aerosol, and you do it as quick as possible. And you put in a, just a single tube and you proceed with your mechanical ventilation and transport towards the intensive care unit. Now with that, uh, I come to an end into my presentation, uh, being a, uh, labeled as a COVID-19 hero, not just a logo. Uh, I thank God that I, did acquire the infection and alhamdulillah, I recovered from it and things went good. Uh, with that, I finished my presentation and I hand over to Dr. Ibrahim. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, Mohammed, for this exciting uh, presentation. And uh, now I'll give the floor to uh, Dr. Al-Anoud Al-Hatimi to present our uh, second uh, presenter, Professor Dawlatli. And we will be more than happy to entertain uh, questions uh, towards the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Zabani. Thank you very much, Dr. Davistani, for the very interesting topic. It's my great pleasure to be here for the first time to uh, this conference, to be invited for the first time. And it's my greatest pleasure to uh, present Dr. Abdul Azim Dawlatli. Dr. Abdulazim Dawlatli, he is uh, a professor in the Department of Anesthesia College of Medicine, King Saud uh, University. And also, he's working in thoracic anesthesia, bariatric anesthesia. Uh, Dr. Dawlatli, he's an instructor in Naisura Ultrasound Guided Workshop, and also, he's an in instructor of Society Ultrasound Anesthesia. Um, Dr. Abdurazim Dawlatli, he's a founder and organizer of the following workshop, Thoracic Anesthesia, Bariatric Anesthesia, How to Write a Scientific Paper, and Inhalational Anesthesia Workshop, Difficult Airway Workshop. He's an editor in Chief Saudi Journal of Anesthesia, reviewer in Anesthesia Analgesia, reviewer in Journal of Clinical Anesthesia, and uh, he's a member in many national and international uh, anesthesia federations. He's having many publications in national and international journals and speaker in many national and international conferences. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Idawlatli and Professor Idawlatli and the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anoud and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ibrahim. And uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Darastani, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, committee, uh, which we will address uh, some issues uh, and update in thoracic anesthesia. Actually, my presentation is not a formal one, and I am going to take you away from the COVID. You know, Dr. Mohammed took this part of the COVID, so I'm going to take you away from it. Hopefully, we are going to resume shortly to the normal routine work with uh, physical attendance. I hope so. So uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, the disclosure. I don't have any conflict of interest of all items which I'm going to present here. Uh, so I'm just the user of all these items. So these are the lecture outlines. I'm going to talk about the lung isolation techniques, double human issues in terms of size, insertion depth, bronchial blockers, bare relief following thoracic surgery, and end with summary. So this is regarding the lung deflation, which I call it lung deflation technique, because as you know, most of our cases are clean cases. 
we don't have such cases where the lung is going to be soiled, you know, isolated lung, soil the healthy lung. So that's why I prefer the term lung deflation techniques. The techniques which adopted are just uh, classified as follow, either without techniques or within techniques. Without techniques means that we are going to use the single human tube and the capnosorax, and within techniques, double human or bronchial blockers. The without technique is, 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 is a protocol. You know, you use a single human tube and you stop ventilation during various needle insertion, CO2 insufflation. This is all during the thoracoscopy. And this is the tidal volume. And then at the end, CO2 off, then silastic tube underwater seal to get all CO2 out, manual ventilation, repeat the same on the other side in case of bilateral uh, sympathectomy. And then the patient go to the PACU and then discharge to the ward. This technique is adopted here in our uh, hospital and all the uh, authors from uh, different parts of the world are quoting it from our theater. These are some of the publications on the same procedure. The other technique of lung deflation is from within double human tubes and or bronchial blockers. Here, just let me talk to you about the double human tube issues. Double human tube issues, two, they are two. First is the size of the double human, which size you use for your patient. And the other issue which is coming now, and it is a hot topic in literatures, is the insertion depth. What is the insertion depth of, w, of your double human tube? And there is here also another issue uh, of less uh, importance, uh, at least for the current time, is airway related complication because it has been sorted out with modifying the technique. Let me start with the size of the double human tube. This is always an issue. If patient come to your OR, then you start to look which size I'm going to use. There are different methods, measured or conventional. Measured, you use this one, which is Brodsky uh, table, okay. Go for the chest X-ray and measure the tracheal diameter. Go for CT scan, measure bronchial diameter. Then you select the left side double human tube according to this timetable. It's cumbersome and I don't think it is practical. Slinger, he put us this simple one based on the patient height. Females, 160 centimeter, you know, 37 French size tube and so on, you know, male and female. Conventional one, for any uh, anesthesiologist, we used to say 35 or 37 for females, 39 or 41 for males. This is a conventional method which we are all using. But here there are some complications reported for uh, WM tube like airway trauma and malpositioning. And here is one of the things, bronchial rupture, secondary to intubation. This is published in 2003. And here is another one, iatrogenic trachea rupture during intubation of W left side W and tube, published 2009. You know, these are the two things, two pictures or, or two literatures which I found. Actually, in, in our current practice now, and for the last seven years, we are using 37 French tube, left sided tube for females, and 37 left sided tube for males. That's our current practice now to avoid any trauma. We are doing some study now on that in order to prove our hypothesis. The indications for of all, all of that, you know, regarding the left side double lumen tube, but what is left for the right double side uh, uh, lumen tube? There are absolute trend relative. Absolute, in case of left mini stem endobronchial tumor, we go for right side double lumen tube. Left mini stem is liver section, tracheobronchial disruption, Aortic aneurysm is the stainal mass a relative, like left pneumonectomy or cardiac surgery, which is minimally invasive. This just, I'm going to show you some of the tubes which are currently we are using, the new ones, relatively new. This is a cell bronch, you know, it is from silicon and it has a reinforced tip in order to, and the bronchial portion in order to avoid any trauma. This is one video, I hope it's going to function. Just to show you the insertion of it. And I show you the cuff herniation and how to treat cuff herniation and to adjust it using the fiber optic bronchoscope. 
it's inserted, as you see, the cuff is here herniated, so it has to be deflated and pushed down. The insertion depth of the left side of the W-human tube is another hot topic. Here, one of our publication on insertion depth of left side W-human tube, we started this on, uh, studied this on 41 other patients, and we correlated this with five currently available formulas. And we came with this formula, which is our formula, which fits our patients. So we start to validate this formula, which is this one on the bottom of this slide. And we came with another article on 66 patients, which published last month in anesthesia intensive care, where we checked the efficacy of this height-based formula. It is a formula which you can use and based on the height of the patient. It's correlated well with the patient height, this formula. And here, the results of this article. The accurate insertion depth detection in our series was in nearly 70% of the cases without any adjustment of the tube using fiber optic bronchoscope. I mean, fiber optic for all cases was used. And I'm not here trying to propagate that you don't use fiber optic, but use fiber optic definitely. We have used for all these cases, but with fiber optic, we have to adjust, you know, there was some too far out by half centimeter to one and half centimeter where we have to adjust. So 30% of the cases, we have to adjust the tube either in or out. But mind you, none of these cases has got any uh, obstruction either to the left upper lobe or the left lower lobe. We have made it very easy for you. You can just go for this, uh, the Play Store uh, in, in any Android, you know, and just write LD, LT, left double human tube. And then it will take you to an application where you install, and then you start to use it. Just put the height of the patient here, and it will measure the use insertion depth from the corner of the mouse. You insert the tube, and at the corner of the mask, adjust it at 30 centimeter, or according to the patient this height, 187 centimeter, and so on. Or if you don't have this Android application, you can use a smartphone. It's easy to be used in the OR setting. I just show you one of the uh, newly launched double uh, human tube, which we call the triple human double human tube. This is from South Korea. I saw it in Geneva in 2019. Euro anesthesia. I got, they sent me some samples. I start using it. This is triple human, double human tube. I think this tube came to exist. We'll see. So this is the tube, double human tube from silicon also. It has three, it has three lumens. One is a green one here, where it takes six cc air. You will see it here. Okay. And then when you insert it, this one will be anchored to the right side wall, and this one will go straight to the left side. So there is no way that any of this double human tube will go to the inadvertently to the right side. So this is one of the advantages of it. And here, this is one of the patients. This is inserted, you know, as usual for any double human tube and rotated anticlockwise 90 degrees. And then remove the stylet. And then you inflate the green cuff 60 C air. You see, these are the triple humans, 60 C air. And you push it until there is resistance. Okay. Now go, you will see now there is a resistance. Then you deflate the green cuff and then inflate the other uh, pilot cuff for the tracheal and the endobronchial portion. Let me move to the bronchial blockers. There are two types, dependent and independent. Dependent like the torque control blocker for the univented tube, independent wire guided endobronchial on it, Cohen, Fuji and ease blocker. 
The dependent blockers, like the univented tube, it has different size, single human, and there is blocker on its anterior channel, and it has a pediatric sizes as well. This is just to show you how it works and how we introduce it. All these uh, kind of techniques, you have to master fiber optic bronchoscope. This is a posterior wall of the trachea, and this is a carina. And here you push, this was right-sided procedure, one of our patients, here to push it to the right side, the blocker and the inflate, and you carry on. Independent blockers, we have the Arnold blocker. You know, all these independent blockers, they have four weight uh, adapter, one to the respirator, one for fiber optic, one for the blocker, and one to the endotracheal tube. This blocker has a got a nylon loop in order to hold the shaft of the fiber optic bronchoscope. All together will go inside and then you direct it wherever you want, right side, left side. This is one patient. And here is the Cohen blocker, which is, has tip deflection and has wheel proximally at its proximal uh, type to direct the, uh, the tip of it. This is uni blocker. This is the ease blocker, the recent one, which has a bifurcated distal end. The problem with this one is it is a high pressure, low volume cuff, not like the other blockers. But it's, it's, it's useful, especially if you have bilateral procedure in, in terms of like the bilateral sympathectomy. This is how it is inserted. And this is a panoramic view. You have to lubricate the tip of it properly. The four-way adapter you place first over single human tube, largest possible size, single human tube. And then you start to, to nav navigate with the fiber optic bronchoscope and the blocker until you place it over the carina like riding horse, you know, I call it like that. As you see on the left side, it is there, but this is an outside the screen. But here you will see now how it is adjusted. Remember all the time, the external laryngeal manipulations in order to place it. If you have any difficulty, just remember to have some manipulations externally. You know, as you see now, now it is inserted well. And this one also, we have used it for uh, tracheostomized patient, you see now. This is the tracheostomy stoma, and then you put the adapter, and then you start to do the same, you know, navigate with the fiber optic scope and the ease blocker. It's, it's, it's easy to be inserted, needs little training, actually. The learning curve is so fast you can attend. And here you have to have an assistant with you all of these blockers, you have to have an assistant because you have to focus on the blocker and he has to focus on the, or she has to focus on fiber optic in other, other ways. And then, Is uh, I look to the screen, and uh, it landed. It landed safely to the to the trick. Yeah. Characteristics of different blockers: on blocker, Cohen uni blocker. I just wanted to show you this one. The channel, which is central channel at uh, the hamter, is 1.440. Uh, this one, and uh, the the east blocker is two millimeter. And uni blocker is two mil means that the fast there is a fast uh, deflation of the lung using the uni blocker or is blocker. There is a procedure how to speed ventilation, how to speed deflation of the lung, um, and uh, you will learn it uh, whenever you have a chance to come. We will let you know about it. 
So the complication of bronchial blockers, either inclusion in the stapling line or occlusion of the trachea removal, this is what is uh, reported. The advantage of these blockers, which are the independent blockers, you can use it in difficult airway, selective lobar blockade, tracheostomy, bilateral procedure. This is applied for all, and fiber optic bronchoscope is an intimate with use of all of this. This is the teaching anesthesia thoracic board, which we are using for teaching our residents. Just two slides on the perilief following thoracic surgery. Thoracic epidural analgesia is a standard for thoracotomy. VATS or RATS, which is a robot assisted, you can use the paravertebral block or erectorospiny plane block, which is recently introduced and we are using it uh, most of the times for bats or rats. So this is uh, just to show you the paravertebral and this is the erector spiny plane block. I think uh, an yeah, average anesthetist has to master this, you know, uh, at least one of those techniques for thoracoscopy patients. This here, the paravertebral space and local anesthetic inserted. You can see the pleura is pushed down. And here you will see the erector spiny. You go to the transversal process, hit it, and then a little bit uh, withdraw. And then you inject your local anesthetic. Um, this is, we used it recently in some of the cases. So I just want to show you this one. This is the case yes, robot, you know, assisted. Look how the console arm is hitting, you know, the patient arm and even the head, you know, sometimes, you know, but you have to be very alerted for that. I put my finger, you know, or my hands, you know, down the, dra the, dra the drapes, you know, trying to avoid this, but you know, I have to be very careful. And this is, you know, during the surgery, even the other lung, you know, which is a ventilated lung has, pleura has been opened. But also you have to be very careful. In summary, average anesthesiologist should master anatomy, tracheobronchial tree, fiber optic bronchoscope, chest X-ray CT scan, left side WM tube, and the insertion depth has to put in mind, either size or insertion depth. One type bronchial blocker you should master as well. Communication with the surgeon is very important, you know, very operatively. And thoracic epidural analgesia for thoracotomy, erectorospinal plane block for thoracoscopy will be a good technique to master as well. This is some of the workshops, you know, pictures in Riyadh 2003, in Paris, in Luxor, in Riyadh again with Peter Slinger, in Riyadh 2006 with Campos, in Oman, in Cairo, in Cape Town, in Riyadh, in Cairo, and KQH, many, many workshops you have done. And this last, which we did in Medina. And uh, I hope we can come back and resume our workshop physically with your attendance. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dowletli, for this exciting and excellent presentation. Uh, now we'll move on to the uh, question and answer session. I have uh, two questions here from the audience. Uh, the first is how to apply lung isolation in a patient with tracheostomy. Uh, Professor Dowletli, if you may take this question, I appreciate yes, it. Yes, I already showed you in the... Uh, the, 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 the video that using the bronchial blockers, you know, any of these bronchial blockers you can use, but uh, I showed you the ease blocker, which is can be inserted easily and successfully. Uh, the second question is how much air can inflate in the endo, uh, bronchial cuff and in the, in the tracheal cuff of the double lumen tube? Uh, the, this one, 5 cc air for the tracheal cuff and uh, 3 cc for the endobronchial cuff. Now, uh, Professor Dawlatli, from your experience, we know uh, inserting a double lumen tube can be challenging sometime. How do you compare the use of single lumen tube with a bronchial blocker or easy blocker in terms of the quality of lung isolation and the ability to oxygenate? I, I, I'll just take it from a different angle, then I'll come to your uh, question. The double lumen tube, definitely the lung deflation is, is better because, you know, the lumen of the double lumen tube is uh, wide enough, so air uh, will all can come out easily without any air trapping. In the bronchial blockers, the air 
trap, you know, the small lumen. So when you block it, you know, the lung cannot be deflated easily. You have to do, we have to go for uh, like uh, a protocol that uh, you disconnect the patient from the respirator, then you deflate the pilot cuff of the bronchial blocker, then wait for 10 seconds, then you inflate the balloon or the pilot cuff of the blocker and connect the patient back to respirator. That which we repeat twice during this, our setting, and then the lung is going to be uh, uh, collapsed. The, regarding the hypoxia, regarding the double human or the, actually, you know, I, 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 I rarely find any patient, you know, uh, got hypoxic, especially if we are going to operate and operate on a diseased lung and the other lung is healthy. Very rarely I, I got this scenario because adjustment of the tube is very important. Once the tube, either double human or the bronchial blocker adjusted well, hypoxia will be unlikely to occur. Uh, great. One last uh, question, Doctor, uh, regarding the erector spinae block that you uh, mentioned. We've been uh, in Jeddah using it for cardiac surgery, and we have noticed an uh, excellent uh, results. Uh, I just want, from your experience, how do you compare for thoracic surgery? How do you compare the thoracic epidural versus the uh, erector spinae block uh, for thoracotomies? Okay, for thoracotomy, we use a standard technique, which is the thoracic epidural analgesia. We don't use the thoracic, uh, you know, erector spinae block in thoracotomy, but we limit use of erector spinae plane block for the thoracoscopy cases, either video assisted or robotic assisted. Great. Uh, a question to Dr. Mohammed Dagostani uh, regarding the extra precautions that should be taken uh, in COVID-19 patient for one lung ventilation. For example, what extra measures do you recommend uh, the use of fiber optic to position uh, the double lumen tube? How uh, do you go about making sure that this does not pose a higher risk than just a regular intubation? Um, that's a very good question because as I mentioned, um, the, everything is, is totally different from what we have trained people about and what we normally do. So the, the, the thing and the most important point is the fact that errors, so anything related bit of aerosol you're going to have to eliminate which means if you're going to do a fiber optic you're going to have at least to stop ventilation temporarily so you avoid any risk of contamination there you're going to have to do it with uh, a quick look with someone who's expert who will not take a long time because these patients are very very sensitive to oxygenation and they desaturate really fast and quick so that is one entity you follow if deflation, as I showed in the picture there, you already put you know, your uh, filter all over, including the, the blocker, including everything. So you avoid any risk of aerosol spread. Some have advocated even a spread of an island cover on top so that at least you contain as well the, the, the air under that nylon cover. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. I received one more uh, question from our audience. Uh, if we are doing left-sided lung isolation, can we do this with a single lumen tube inserted deep into the right side? You mean, if it is for adults, you know, I don't think it's going to be a good practice because, you know, nowadays we have a lot of options and alternatives uh, uh, like this lumen tubes, I display it to you and the bronchial blockers. So I don't think this is going to be a good practice in adult population. But in theatrics, you can do that in, in, in case you don't have, you know, and we're practicing this in the past, you know, when we were not having these uh, different types of uh, bronchial blockers, dependent indep and uh, independent ones. But still, uh, you know, with the uh, evolution, in the uh, different materials, you know, for thoracic anesthesia. In pediatric also, we can use the um, uh, Arnold blocker even for infants, you know, and children, and the bronchial blocker and the other one, which is the univented tube as well. So I, I, I don't know, you know, it depends on your setting, but you know, currently in this uh, uh, modern anesthesia practice, I don't think uh, you need to, to do that for your patient. Good. Uh, Dr. Al-Anoud, do you have any uh, question? Yeah. 
thank you very much for Dr. Daghestani and Prof. Daulatli. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Daghestani. Uh, if you end up having a double lumen tube in COVID patient, uh, would you risk replacing this tube if you end up needing this patient to be intubated post-op, sending him to ICU? And if you, like, if you struggle with the difficult airway or something like that, would you replace the tube or would you keep it for a couple of days? <laughs> I made it difficult. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there, there is no right answer for this. Let me just yeah. be there. It's going to be, depends on the, um, the situation. It depends on the condition of the patient. Depends. When you say difficult, was it in my hand or in, in someone who's, you know, who's not an expert in the field? Uh, a colleague with the same level of, of experience, definitely that carries a weight in that decision for sure. Now, the question here, whether should you leave a double lumen tube or not? Now, we, we know from mechanical ventilation point of view for critical care, the best is a single tube, yeah. a large pore, so you could actually even clear secretions and, and if you need to, to, um, to do any interventions later on for diagnostic purposes with fiber optic, then you have the ability to carry on that task later. Um, if it comes down, there is a risk on the patient. You may have to leave it for a few days for sure. Everybody would actually take the safety approach because we know in those patients, COVID especially, their, their oxygenation is always the trickiest of all. Um, I know it's not the best you know, scenario there to leave a double lumen tube, but if you have to, you have to, you have no choice. Uh, if you're going to replace it, again, you stop ventilation completely, you put your uh, bronchial you know, exchange catheter and, and you quickly switch in and out and then you resume ventilation back. You have to judge it based on the situation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Daulatli, I have a question for you. In the triple lumen tube, how much air are you gonna inflate it? The green one, I mean. Uh, it's a recommended 6 cc air. 6 It is, high, yes, it's a high volume, low pressure cuff. Yeah, is it available here in Saudi or you got it from? No, it is not, no, actually uh, it's not available. I just got samples, I start using it, but we are going to uh, make it available, uh, I think uh, not before next year. Okay, thank you very much for both of you. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Professor Dawlakli, I just received one uh, last question here. What's the role of fiber optic for confirmation of placement? Is it mandatory? Oh, yes. I think, yes, it's mandatory. The way I displayed to you that there is um, uh, insertion depth of W tube using the formula. By the way, the formula is only available for Android applications, Play Store. It is not available for Apple. And uh, if you do have an Apple, you can use the smart uh, you know, calculator. So it's mandatory. And even with this insertion depth formula, still mandatory to check the W tube using fiber optic bronchoscope. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, our session is coming to an end. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our attendees. We have more uh, than 500 uh, attendees. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to thank the co-chairman of the session, Dr. Al-Anoud Al-Hatmi, and our two excellent presenters, Dr. Daghestani and Dr. Dawlatli. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, just uh, as an announcement, at 4 o'clock, we will have two parallel sessions. Uh, the first one in Hall 1, the medical legal session, and in Hall 2, the chronic pain session. Uh, thank you very much, and wish you a uh, pleasant uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, uh, uh, Thanks, everyone.